What up, everybody? Welcome to another rendition of Fast and Curious, where we talk to HubSpot partners that are running the race and scaling. Today, we have with us from the CRM squad, Eli Jeleva, co-founder, chief problem solver, claims fame, four months from gold to platinum. They're also known in the ecosystem for recruitment, four, they have four co-founders all coming some variety from recruitment. Some even have recruitment businesses they're in for or currently have. Eli specifically here is a HubSpot certified trainer in the HubSpot lessons program. And this month over recording, May 2024, name community champion. Welcome to the show. HubSpot magic much. maker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Matt. Really appreciate you inviting me on the show. Yeah, I, I just love we need more people telling these stories and it's just more and more powerful as HubSpot gets larger and larger. Ellie, I, I love this portion. We talk fast and serious when we start, which is everybody has a unique story about what them what made them start, what made them burn the ships and say, I will bet my my, I will bet a lot of money. I'll bet a lot of my, some future in creating a HubSpot solutions partner. What led you here today? What made you say HubSpot is where I want to make my future? It all started with a conversation with a few of us that currently are partners, because even though that we all have recruitment backgrounds, we come from different businesses. Some of us in house, some of us agency side. And because we have been exposed to so many businesses over the years, what we have recognized is that there is a need in the market for people who know how to work with the CRM. Because the observation is that there are quite a lot of businesses that buy the product, isn't with all the best intentions, but either the champion is no longer there, other things happen, there's not high adoption, and then there are those zombie submissions, uh, zombie subscriptions that stay mm -hmm. there and our businesses are paying for and actually are not driving value. So we thought that, okay, there is a gap in the market. We have the experience. We have the enthusiasm. Let's do it. Why HubSpot? I mean, I say that, especially recruitment, there's a lot of niche specific CRMs or even ATSs that both are CRM and ATS. What made you say HubSpot is the CRM that I'm going to build a business on? In all honesty, we're a HubSpot, HubSpot partner, but we do help with Salesforce, Dynamics, mm -hmm. Zoho, Pipedrive. Obviously, Monday.com called themselves a CRM as well, so we support that too. But with HubSpot, because we, we anticipated their growth in a way, and we did the research and we found that where they're going is aligned with where we want to go and the, the opportunity in the market presented itself, I think, in a nice way. And obviously the interface is easy to use, so we felt that the adoption rate will be higher with us anyway. If I understand this right, and the y'all's thought in go to market is, hey, we're generally tool agnostic, you have a CRM, you need to be able to execute on it. And mm -hmm. based on your process, we'll help you pick the CRM that's best for you. And then HubSpot, and you just happen to like HubSpot a lot. <laughs> it's like, yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And as a startup, because we've only been going for two and a half years as a startup, we need to be very mindful of where our time goes. And that's why we have to focus on something. And as I said, because of the aforementioned reasons, there were things that led us to choose HubSpot over other providers. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I've had lots of these conversations in the same way. It's, hey, we actually helped a lot of people and we just ended up liking HubSpot more. And then we have to make a choice. And you'll probably talk about this in like scaling challenges. It's, it's very difficult to scale if you do mm -hmm. six things all at the same time. And yeah. so you have to eventually pick and make a bed somewhere or mm -hmm. niche. As you think about where you've been for two and a half years, you're still in startup mode. You'll have around eight to 10 people, right? And you start with four. Like, where are you? Where are you at today? And what percentage of your revenue is HubSpot? How are you thinking about like where you are today and where you want to go tomorrow? In terms of the revenue split, I'll probably say that 80% 80, 80 of our, yeah, 80 of our revenue is in one way, shape or, or form involved with HubSpot because we do implementations, mm -hmm. 
we do campaigns, we do obviously the call outreach, we do marketing, we do integrations. So for some customers, actually we do performance marketing. They have HubSpot and we measure on HubSpot and we help them with the nurture campaigns on HubSpot, but the primary service that we provide for them is the performance marketing. So HubSpot is still involved, but it's not the full retainer price, for example. Okay. But usually all involving HubSpot. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And this is our foot in the door very often. Because I said, yeah. our sweet spot is companies that already have HubSpot, which was actually one of the challenges to up tier, but I'm sure we'll come to that in a bit. <laughs> yeah. So today you'll have how many, around how many employees do you have at this point? We have eight and uh, we're in the process of hiring more. I think that by the end of the year, we could comfortably get to 10 or even 11. Oh, wow. In, That's in awesome. stage of rapid growth. It, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And growth begets complexity and gets uh, more difficult to scale and your are efficiencies. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to, so your are point in time. We are two and a half years in, we are 80% of our revenue is coming from adjacent, adjacent revenue. We are growing from, we're eight, about to be 10, maybe 11 people in a, a rapid growth. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. What challenges, or maybe you're still figuring those out. What are the challenges that you had to overcome to get here? The top three, like, hey, these are the things that we had to figure out or, or think we figured out now that we had to get through for CRM squad to be, to get to 10, to get to 10 employees and experience rapid growth. One of the thing was the product offering. Mm. And the reason for that is first world problems. But uh, the reason for that is because the core people, the founders that were within the team, we have very, we have very strong skill set, but in quite a lot of things. So trying to hone what it is we offer, given that we do offer quite a lot of things and we can help with quite a lot of things and just defining those products offerings i think was one of the challenge because no word of a lie we only define them to put them on the website the way they are today probably a year ago which means that for the first year and a half we we knew what we were doing but the go-to-market strategy was let's do it so let's see how we can help you as opposed to having the more uh, productized offering which is now more streamlined which obviously has helped with the growth yeah, there's a, I think it's interesting. How did you, especially the first year and a half, maybe still going into it, what, gosh, your decks are different. You're like, you're giving custom proposals to employees. What, how did you, how do you think about packaging and pricing? Like you started this saying, hey, we have a lot of experience in the recruitment industry. Is the way you're thinking about packaging, does it reflect a industry specific or like, how did you think through it and how did you come to say, okay, this is what we're going to land at, especially when you have so many skills and so many things you could do. Yeah. I think that in fact, this is one of our unique propositions anyway, that when customers work with us, is in 85 or even 90% at the moment of customers are retainer based. And mm. whenever someone has a retainer, they have access to everyone within the team. So mm. whilst they, they would purchase a service, so that the product offering, we would give them insights that not many other people would in a way. And for example, one of our founders, he's an investor and we spoke to someone who actually wanted to grow their business because he had himself sold his recruitment company. So he has experience in that which means that having access to someone of his caliber is not something that pretty much any other HubSpot agency mm. could do for you. And that's why we have, um, of course, depending on the size and so on, but more or less a very flat fee for a day rate, and then we can figure out projects. But when it comes to the retainers, we have a day rate that we, we negotiate, but within that day rate, there's, it's not related to the the specificity of the task is not related to the industry. It just means that, okay, you have that much of our time. Because mm. I used to do freelancing before becoming part of CRM Squad. One of the things I used to say even to clients, exactly because I have a lot of skills in various areas and I'm quite technical, which for marketer very often is, is not that popular in a way, in that comment. 
so when people were saying to me, okay, so for that money, what can you do? And I said, I can sort out your HubSpot. I can sort out your SEO. I can train your team. I can make you coffee. It's going to be expensive coffee, but I can make you coffee. Whatever you think is going to help you because... I'm one of, here in the UK, there is a government scheme for helping businesses grow. It's literally called Help to Grow Scheme. And I'm one of the mentors for the government. So I'm talking to businesses, I'm coaching them. And this is what I mean, that my day rate is this. So whatever you can make out of it is and I'm here to help. And the same with CRM Squad, what we're doing at the moment. Because we're here to add value. That's the ultimate goal. Not to be shoehorned into statement of work, even though that sometimes that's required. And I love that. I think taking the packaging so you can, it seems like y'all have nailed it and have unique value in it and how you're going to market. What are the two other problems, challenges that you had to think through in order to hit platinum and start hitting your, this rapid growth you're experiencing now? The other challenge, especially from hitting the platinum is the sold points because HubSpot wants you to mm. sell because it's a resale program. But because our primary focus, and as I mentioned, the reason we started the business in the first place is to help companies that already have a CRM in place, just don't know how to make the most of it. That meant that quite quickly we managed to get, we managed to get the managed revenue, but then there was no sold. So that's why it took us, mm -hmm. because we only became uh, gold in September last year and in February this year. So four, one and a half, five months later, we became platinum. So it's about building the momentum, but it took some time to build that momentum because especially when we knew, even though that we have a lot of connections in the kind of business industry, even though we have the connections, we knew with the HubSpot offering and that's why we couldn't, yeah, we, we couldn't push as much. I'm sure that you would understand that as a startup, there's only so much you can do <laughs> before you burn out. And you have to wear different hats. And if anything, if I have to be honest, we have been very strategic on not to grow too fast. Exactly because mm. it took us a little bit of time to figure out what it is we're offering. So we wanted to be in a position where we attract the team slowly. But then when they come to us, they know what it is we do, what it is we want to do when we grow up, and how they could contribute to that. As opposed to just focusing on getting those numbers and then figuring out later. Yeah, the value of having experienced veterans starting a company. I've done it different ways before, so I can do it. So we talk about pricing, packaging. Mm -hmm. Number two, there's a challenge of tiering, which creates momentum. Once you have tiering, it actually it, it, it yeah. starts to create momentum. Especially in HubSpot, now you can talk to reps differently. Like, it just changes. Yeah. What's number, what within tiering change that allowed you to get moved from managed to sold? What was it organic? Did you change or it just happened? I think that it just happened from the point of view that as a business, as I said, we defined the offering and one of our offering is fractional CMO. And from that, mm. we started getting contracts for people that didn't have CRM. And obviously because we did such a great job for them, they were open to now expand their budget and look for ways to optimize their whole performance. So this is where we said we also have spot partner. Maybe we can talk. That makes just as we, as we summarize this is you're getting your pricing, your offering. The most important thing you have is revenue yeah. for the business, not your yeah. HubSpot tier. Let's be clear. So like you're do this, do this in order. Yeah. And once you have a, then they're like, Hey, we should have a package now that we understand what we want to do. We're going to standardize around HubSpot. Let's put a package that will allow us to win in the ecosystem we want to play in. So I love how you're like thinking through this. Challenge number three. What was the, as you're, because y'all started with four people, you're not eight, you've doubled the company. What are the other challenges as you continue expanding that you had to face? Well, the, it's exactly that finding the right people and having full-time people obviously means that you need to have some sort of predictability of revenue. But when we started, our work was a lot more project-based because people were testing us out. This is where we had to rely on freelancers a lot more. And I think that, yeah, it was challenging finding reliable people because sometimes, let's say in the morning, you and I are from CRM Squad and we have a chat with a client and it's super good and the client says, hey, could you do that for us? 
I say, yeah, we can think about it, not a problem. And then we reach out to some freelancers because we always looking for um, kind of freelancers, good experts to, to have on our books in case. So we reach out to a couple of people. There is even a person who quoted hundred pounds an hour as a freelancer, which I thought that was quite ambitious, but because we needed that and we even reached out and said, listen, we have this project. Never heard from them. I'm thinking, okay. But then what happened is that in the meantime, because we know that the client would love this thing, we said, oh yeah, we'll figure it out. And in our minds, on the back of our minds, we're thinking, yeah, but we'll get it outsourced. So we couldn't outsource it. And then it came back to us because we wouldn't jeopardize our name in front of the client. And we're here to add value. So the late nights, the weekends, all mm. that. So it has been very tough to find people. And I was thinking, if I was to ask for hundred pounds an hour, I would be calling you to say, listen, do you still need me? How can I help? As opposed to you chasing me and then me not picking up the phone, not returning emails. It was very strange. Very strange. As if people, and that's very cynical way of thinking, as if people oversold themselves. They I can do this, I can do this. And then you send them the scope and say, okay, so let's talk about the practicalities and how you can start. And then they get scared and, oh, because for me, there's no other explanation. Why would you have the capability? Someone is offering the money and then you don't take it. I don't know. How, how did you end up finding people? Is it Did you find that through starting with a contract and turning them into full-time? Or did you have a full interview process in the first couple? We had a full interview process on some people we have taken from previous companies that we have worked together. So we started mm -hmm. relying on, on contacts that we knew from the past. Mm. But yeah. Mm. We talked about these three challenges, which which is getting your pricing packaging done. Yep. Tiering inside the ecosystem helps about once you have that, which is getting sold credit, not necessarily managed credit. Yeah. Number three is finding reliable it's transitioning from contract to FTE. Like it's like that transition is difficult. Yeah. You're now what is if you had one let's let's just say as you're building, just is what is something you would never do again? that you've done these last two and a half years. Like, mm, that was a mistake. Don't do that again. I'll be very interested to ask the same question to the rest of the team. But from my point of view, is an I, I'm looking a lot more at the moment into spirituality, quantum physics and fields and so on. And I believe in co-creation. So I believe that if certain things had not happened, Maybe other things wouldn't have happened in the same way. So I don't think that there would be anything that I'll say, oh, never again, because every single thing was a learning opportunity. And we have learned, <laughs> isn't yet. We have paid, paid the price for the learning, but we have learned. And with that, we've got better, we got stronger. So I would not necessarily take anything away. But is it, I'm interested to find out what the team is going to say. I would, if I was receiving that answer, I would say always the, an attitude matters a lot. And when circumstances happen, uh, you can't change circumstances always, but you can have control your attitude and how you look at it matters. And so I would never, so I hear what I, you may, I'm hearing is I never do again would be uh, something like I would never sacrifice any of the opportunities I've had just something like in some way. Yeah. Like I'm saying, it, uh, what yeah. would you have done or what is an opportunity uh, or something you wish you could do earlier? Yeah. Uh, hey, I wish we would have thought about doing this earlier. I would say getting an admin person. Hmm. Do you um, mean executive division? assistant or like admin to the business? Is that paying finance, payroll? When you say admin, what do you mean by admin? No, it's just the PA, VA type of thing. Mm. Because what I found, as I said, given that we're still in the startup stages, even though the team is growing, especially initially for the first year or so, we were doing all the doing including the sales, the marketing, the finance, the payroll, the quotes. And I had lists, quite, and we all did have lists upon lists upon lists of tasks. And quite a lot of them, the reality is, oh, follow up with this person and then follow up on the follow up in case they didn't come back to you the first time. So there's a lot of things that you don't need the HubSpot, the HubSpot skill sets to be able to do that. But it just takes my cognitive capacity, I guess, to know that, oh, there's seven people I haven't gone back to because very often I'm back to back. Mm -hmm. I have six, seven meetings during the day 
and then come 6 p.m. and I take a, a breather. Oh, wait. Yeah, and the notes from this meeting, then to have the consistency and due diligence to put them in the system to then to then implement things. A couple of things have slipped, is hand on heart, unfortunately, but over the years, there have been a couple of things that have slipped because of that. But now, obviously, we're in a better position. We have a project management system and, and things are the way you expect them to. So I would have definitely, if I had to change something, I would have implemented that straight away. Mm. I still struggle from that. And I've just now got a VA as a service and it is it's very helpful. <laughs> I'm just like, yes. As we're, what's a, a big bet? If you think about 2024 and you think about your CRM squad, what's the thing? Hey, this is the strategic bet we're making in the future that we're going to build towards. And it's our hypothesis that we're trying to validate. What's that thing for you? We definitely want to grow as a business. That's for sure. I'll probably say going past the 1 million mark in terms of revenue. And what I personally have aspirations to do is to be one of the few people or the only person in the ecosystem that has every single certificate available on the academy. I already have 35 of them. I did 17 in the certification week alone. And because I want CRM Squad to be one of the most awarded partners, one of the most recognized from exactly the underdog side of things, not one of the elite partners just yet, but to, to have had all those places where people say, actually, yeah, you have the community champion, you have the, the certified trainer, the HubSpot user group leader, the academies, and all those things. And, and I just want to dominate the space. <laughs> That's my ambitious, audacious goals. I love it. Be the, as we saw, the, the HubSpot magic. Yeah, I'll just be like, as a, when I come, HubSpot magic happens. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Eddie, if people would like to reach out on a continued conversation, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Probably on LinkedIn. Luckily for, because I'm from Bulgaria and my name is not as uh, uncommon there. <laughs> but for the English speaking world, my name is very uncommon. Therefore, if you just write Eli Geneva on Google, on LinkedIn, somewhere you'll find me. Eli, uh, appreciate you being part of it. Thank you for sharing your story where you're at today. Hope to have you back when we all hit Diamond or Eli. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much, Matt. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Perfect. Stay awesome. Keep doing a big. Yeah. Adios, everybody.